Welcome to Detroit Unspun TV. My name is Dave Lingholm and I will be your tour guide for the next half hour of stories about Metro Detroit's transformation. We got out of our office this week and got out to Western Wayne County, so we'll be bringing you a few stories from that part of our region. We also came back downtown to do our weekly Dig Downtown 5 segment, just in case you wanted to come visit. So sit down, put away the mouse, and enjoy the next half hour of Detroit Unspun TV. In headlines this week, the owner of the now defunct Packard plant announced plans to demolish that venerable old structure, which sent the social media universe twittering about what's going to happen to some of the murals that are located and where urban explorers are going to go in Detroit for their next adventure. The Detroit Free Press did an excellent job of recapping the social media reaction to those headlines. Governor Rick Snyder this week announced a new public safety initiative that's going to address crime in cities such as Saginaw, Flint, Pontiac, and Detroit. And the Detroit News gave us a very unique look at the salt mines located 1,400 feet below the surface underneath the city of Detroit. And from our own blog, Ashley Hennon had the chance to sit down with some of the artists at the Chocolate Cake Design Collective to talk with them about how they pull their ideas together and why the collective isn't, doesn't have anything at all to do with baking cakes. Now for more stories about Detroit's transformation like these, be sure to follow us on Facebook. Just go over to the search area on the website, type in Detroit Regional News Hub, and you'll be sure to find us. Now our first story this week comes to you from the city of Plymouth, which is about a half hour from downtown Detroit, right along I-96. Located between half, just about halfway between Detroit and Ann Arbor, Plymouth has been a very popular place for many young families to call home. We asked Todd Waller from Professional One Real Estate, what makes Plymouth such a unique and attractive community for families? I think the, 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 the fascination or the draw with Plymouth uh, truly is, well, it's the community, quite frankly. We have a, a smaller city here, but a phenomenal downtown area, very strong. So one of the biggest draws for the city of Plymouth, uh, truly about a half block from here, is Kellogg Park. Kellogg Park is the, the public gathering place where just about every weekend there seems to be something going on. So you've got some, some family activities uh, mm -hmm. oriented specifically for the families, of course, here in, in the city of Plymouth. And then you've got right along Main Street here uh, between Ann Arbor Trail and, and uh, Penniman, you've got some phenomenal restaurants as well. You know, you've got um, uh, Fiamma's, you have um, the other place that I cannot remember, and the Sardine Room, <laughs> which is coming in. Uh, so you've got some excellent uh, nightlife, if you will, some great restaurants. And even if you're not coming here in the um, evening, you've got some phenomenal afternoon eateries and coffee places to, to take in. And then let's not forget Front Street. Front Street is that one street just west of Main Street mm -hmm. that has some excellent shops. Uh, there's a wine bar over there. Um, there's even a place called uh, the Burger Spot, excellent burgers and fries. So there are a lot of businesses that you can uh, take advantage of, do some shopping. But there's also that sense of community. Mm -hmm. All of these businesses don't exist without the sense of community that Plymouth has. I love the fact that my office is so close to the action, if you will. It is very close to, to downtown. My personal draw here, again, goes back to the whole community aspect. Uh, I enjoy working, period, with people getting into homes or coming out of homes to buy or sell homes. And when it involves a buyer or a seller here in, in the city of Plymouth, uh, it allows me to see a little bit more of the community that Plymouth has to offer its residents and people that are interested in coming into Plymouth itself. So if I had to nail it down to one specific thing that I really enjoy about Plymouth and what I believe its number one value proposition is, it truly comes down to community. Uh, did you know that we have a freestanding wall from the original Daisy uh, air rifle manufacturing um, company, manufacturing plant? 
and, really? and I say freestanding because uh, the story that I've heard is that the developer came to the city and said, I want to take this property and I want to turn it into condominiums and townhouses. And the city said, yeah, that's not a problem, but we want some semblance of our history incorporated. Well, it's unclear, at least that I've heard, uh, as to whether it was intended to be this way or not. But as the developer finished out the development, um, they were unable to incorporate the last remaining standing wall from the original Daisy Air Rifle manufacturing plant. So if you go uh, just a short drive down uh, Union here, you'll see this freestanding wall that's propped up, and it is the original wall from the manufacturing plant of Daisy Air Rifles. Wow. Heck, we've got an, uh, an ice fest that's been going on for, was it 30 years now, something mm -hmm. along those lines? And they draw people from international locations to come in and compete in the International Ice Carving Festival. That's extraordinary. So I think it's the intentionality of making sure that this community is open to everybody, not just folks that are here, but folks from outside the area that come on in. More specifically, I think that the people who live here get it. They have found themselves a gem, and they want to share that gem with as many other people as possible. And so I think the word spreads through that, mm -hmm. that, hey, you know, we live a quarter mile from downtown Plymouth. Come on over. We'll have a barbecue. And then when the uh, barbecue's over, we'll go on wandering downtown and, and maybe uh, grab a cup of coffee and go hang out in Kellogg Park, for example. Um, so how else do you foster that sense of community? I think it comes through word of mouth, quite frankly. It almost doesn't matter what your housing situation, uh, housing preference is. We kind of have it all for you. So if you are that, that uh, young urban professional that's looking for a, a hip place to go that has an active nightlife, well, we've got some condos that, that may fit exactly what you're looking for. Or possibly you want yourself in a home. Yeah, we've got homes that will probably fit your needs as well. Are you a young couple that is expecting children or something along those lines here? You know what? We've got homes for that as well. So it is, from my perspective, a very unique situation because you do have the gamut. You've got the whole cross-section of potential uh, housing opportunities here, and they're really unique too. So you may have a home that was built in 2006, and right next door the lot, that home was built in the late 1800s, early 1900s. So I could show this home and expect the greatest and latest in building construction right there, go right next door and show that uh, home right next door, and holy smokes, now we're looking at architectural details where you've got solid wooden doors and you've got the handcrafted uh, you know, stair railings and stuff like that. So it really does run the gamut, and it's a lot of fun as a, a real estate professional to be able to show those homes and, and highlight the, the city of Plymouth itself and all it has to offer. Now, one of those unique places in Plymouth is a coffee shop called Espresso Elevado. They just celebrated their year anniversary, and Ashley Hennon had the opportunity to file this story. Espresso Elevado is one of downtown Plymouth's quaint coffee bars, but it's also a microbean roaster. Inside, we spoke to owner Teresa Pillars about choosing fair trade beans, her roasting process, and brewing methods. She gives us a demonstration of the pour-over brewing style and tells us about her personal commitment to sustainability in her shop. Well, um, we found that there's no comparison with the flavor and the extraction that you can gain from doing the pour-over method. We have an automatic brewer that we use for special events and catering and such, but the pour-over method allows you to control a lot more of the brewing parameters, so, um, such as the temperature of the water. You should brew between 195 and 205, and we brew right at 204, and we heat up everything so it's the proper temperature, so we can control that. We can grind everything fresh right before brewing, and then pour in a, a small amount to um, create a bloom in the fresh roasted coffee, which is when the coffee is releasing its CO2 gas. We have a slight pause, and then we can continue our pour, so we can control a lot of the parameters and make sure that the, um, the flavor and the um, the temperature and everything is optimal in the cup. The pour over brewing is not brand new. It's been around since at least the 70s that I know of in this country and um, they used to do it at home. Hippies used it and it's kind of having a resurgence now but a lot of these trends have come from the west uh, west coast so places like California, Portland, Seattle have started the trend and now it's spreading this way and a lot of quality focused cafes are choosing this as their methods of choice. 
I take the sustainability and green aspect very seriously. We use all green cleaners in our shop because I don't want anybody in our environment to be exposed to harsh chemicals. We try to purchase mostly organic and also um, directly traded or fairly traded coffee because there's a person on the other end of the transaction and I don't want them to be exposed to chemicals. Um, what else do we do? We try to compost a lot of our coffee. We also have a family that has chickens and we take the chaff, um, which is a byproduct of our roasting, and we save that for them and they put it in their chicken coops. So there's all kinds of little things that we're trying to do to be more sustainable. Fresh roasting on site is a huge part of what we do. It helps us control the quality of the product that we're putting out and put out the freshest possible product. And then the drinks we do are unlike any place else. We um, make our own syrups, we're using our fresh roasted beans, and um, we try to go toward the culinary end so that people are having less sugar but full of flavor. I would say my first exposure to coffee was in 94. I worked in a small coffee bar in Northville, and it struck my interest, but I did it as side jobs. In between jobs, I'd always go back to coffee. And I started making my first business plan about 10 years ago, and it just never came to fruition until everything came together. And about three years ago, I started roasting, and then I ended up working at a great roastery in Ann Arbor called Mighty Good, and I got more experience. And then finally, the, the site became available, and it was my dream spot. I love this site in Plymouth, um, and it all came together. And we work hard at it, and it's not only the quality in the cup, but um, the quality of the interactions with our customers, most of them we know on a first name basis. It's a pleasure getting to know them and they're, they're part of our lives now and we know when they're on vacation, we know their families, so just getting to know people has been really rewarding. Now, while we were in Western Wayne County this week, we decided to go up to the city of Livonia to a place called Joe's Produce, where Chef Riva showed us how to use a lot of fruit that's in season to make a salmon dish that you're not going to forget. So we're here with Chef Riva at Joe's Produce in Livonia. Thanks for having us in. What are we making today? We are making a jerk fire grilled salmon with uh, orange and pineapple salsa and quinoa. Looks like we're ready to go, so walk me through it a little bit. Alrighty, so we have a jerk seasoning. It's the island jerk and we sell it. At Joe's Produce, I like to use uh, products that are good and then you can just pull off the shelf. It's pretty easy. We're going to take that, we're going to put it in the pizza oven. I love this pizza oven, by the way. It's fantastic. It's nice. It's fantastic. So this has been in there. Look at that. We're going to let that sear. I, I know you can't get that sizzle on camera, but that just sounds good. Yes. Yeah. So the next thing we're going to do is make our um, pineapple pizza salsa. Okay. And we have great produce here at Joe's Produce, so this is some fresh pineapple. I'd hope you do your job. <laughs> we have awesome fruit. Uh, fresh pineapple, fresh corn segments, lime segments, and fresh tomatoes, a little bit of uh, vegetable oil, some uh, green onions, some fresh squeezed orange juice that we make here at Joe's Produce, ground chipotle powder for just a tiny bit of smokiness, and a little kick, and some cilantro. Now, is this something you're normally making here at, the, at, at Joe's Produce, or is this one of the um, things you can get with the catering? You can get this with your catering. Um, I made this today because we make a, um, a hot wine every day, so it's hot food that we create every day. You can come in for lunch, you can come in for dinner, and so I made that as one of the special things. So we try to switch it up and make some new and different things on our hot What is it about... I guess, how do, you, how do you come up with a recipe like this? How do you, you know, where, where does that inspiration come from? Well, the inspiration really comes from going out on the floor and seeing all the beautiful produce, um, the things that are in season. Mm -hmm. Right now, there's a lot of citrus in season. You know, the oranges and the limes are all in season right now. So when I go out there, you know, it's a ray of color and smells, and I just go out there and I shop out there on the floor. It's going to be kind of fun for you. Yeah, it's, it's really inspiring. 
go out there and be able to grab whatever you want, things that are peak season and taste the best and create something from that. How did you decide to get started as a chef? Um, my mom's a great cook and I was that was my chore. I didn't want to go outside and shovel the snow, so I was inside making hot job. That's not a bad choice if you ask me. That's no. not a bad choice at all. Now how long for this? How long do you leave the salmon in? The salmon, since this oven is at 560 degrees right now, it's going to take probably just a few minutes to cook. Right now you can see that it's getting firm, but it's going to take a few minutes to cook. We're going to leave that right in there. Super duper hot. How do you know when the salmon is done? When it's nice and firm, when you can feel it, um, touch it, and it kind of springs back, it's, it's pretty much done. Because okay. you know, normally the salmon is pretty It's pretty soft, soft yeah. so once it gets firm, it takes about uh, eight minutes okay. to cook. Very good, very good. Um, what else were we going to have with, I know we've got the salsa, we've got some quinoa. We have some quinoa, which is the super green. Mm -hmm. It's a complete protein. And I've been eating it for the past couple weeks because it's just really super good for you. You can use it in place of rice or couscous or barley. You can use it in the place of those things that are, you know, not that good for you. But quinoa is it's fantastic. And quinoa's got a lot of protein in it, too. Right? Yeah, it's, it's really a complete protein. It's the only grain that's actually a complete protein. So, you know, a vegetarian could take this uh, quinoa and put it with salsa and they could have a, a meal with some vegetables and you have your complete protein. So I love it. And for the catering side, do you have a lot of need for vegetarian recipes like that? The cool part with our catering is that we customize a lot of things. So if you, you know, if your party is vegetarian, well, we don't have very many vegetarian things on the menu, I will customize the menu for you and Laura will present it to you. Very so nice. that's pretty awesome that we can customize things for each individual party. That's pretty, uh, that's pretty rare sometimes to find somebody right. that's willing to work with you on menus like right. that. Right. We're willing to work with you on menus. We're willing to um, go to your house and cook. You know, if it's a large party or a small party, we do it all. Kind of like a one-stop catering venue here. Very good. Mm -hmm. Very good. So I guess it's just about time to place this. Yeah, so we're going to just take our uh, quinoa and put it in our bowl. And the cool part about it is that, you know, even if you're at home, you can make a beautiful yeah, presentation. We're going to take yeah, our salmon, which is very nice. Now, that's a towel right here. Turn that over there real quick. This is super hot. Just tearing all by itself. It's great. Take our salmon off. Put that right on top. And our salsa. And it just makes its own sauce with the orange juice. That's a good looking presentation, too. It's yummy. It's delicious. And it's good for you. You have your vegetables, you have your grain, your protein, two proteins actually. Yeah, a couple of proteins, mm -hmm. the fruit and vegetable that you need every day. It looks like a great dish. Exactly. Thanks for the time. Thank you very much. Now coming back down I-96, you eventually hit downtown Detroit. And when you get downtown, you want something to do when you're here, right? Good. Here's this week's Dig Downtown 5. Spring training baseball radio broadcasts. Sometimes warm, sometimes freezing weather. Springing our clocks forward. The end of ice skating at Campus Marshes Park for the season. Buds forming on the trees. Flower stalks struggling to break through the cold, hard ground. These are sure signs of spring, and they can only mean one thing. That it's time for you to get out of the house and enjoy yourself in downtown Detroit. Here are five suggestions to put some spring into your activities in downtown this weekend. Number one, Detroit Cash Mob at the Detroit Hardware. Now the onset of spring also means the onset of spring cleaning season. So get it started right by getting your supplies at Detroit Hardware and supporting a great local merchant while you're at it. Number two, an evening at the Fountain Bistro to benefit City Year Detroit. 
A skating season might be over at Campus Marshes Park, but there are other fun events that are just beginning. Enjoy s'mores roasted over an open fire, tasty appetizers, and some great company while raising money for an organization that's working hard to transform the educational opportunities for kids in Detroit. Number three, Lunch and Learn, Michael score on fruit trees. Now, Lafayette Greens is more than just another city park. It's also an active community garden. It benefits the local community by providing fresh food for local food banks and by educating people about maintaining their own gardens. This event will show you how the garden will be working to maximize the produce they're able to glean from their trees. Number four, Saras Day by Karpov the Wreck Train, opening photography session. Now you've seen his, his photos in a variety of publications, including on our own blog. But now you can meet the man behind the moniker and imagine Southwest Detroit through his lens. And while this event is not in downtown, it's worth the short detour to see the work of a good friend of Dig Downtown Detroit. And number five, the 54th annual St. Patrick's Day Parade. Now Detroiters love a good parade and there are few better than this annual procession through Corktown. It caps off a morning full of activities, including a 5K race and mass at St. Patrick's Catholic Church. From outside Comerica Park, that's this week's Dig Downtown 5. This past Wednesday, Mayor Dave Bing delivered his State of the City address to the residents of Detroit, and there were several viewing parties. We decided to stop by one at Pulse Lounge downtown to get the reaction of Detroiters to what the mayor has to say. During his third State of the City address as mayor of Detroit, Dave Bing touted many of the accomplishments of his administration, and he also talked about many of the challenges facing the city of Detroit. He talked about the opportunity the city has to improve public lighting, create neighborhood partnerships to improve public safety, raising the old Brewster projects, and, a com and his commitment to keep recreation centers open in the city of Detroit. But was it enough to satisfy the needs of the voters of Detroit. We stopped by the Declare Detroit viewing party of the State of the City Address to get some reaction. Here's what we found. You know what? I absolutely loved it. I think the biggest part of the city is safety because there is a lot to do down here. It is, I came down here because I have a blast. So I am itching to actually move into one of these lofts down here because I've been building a lot of them at a pretty fast rate. So as I think you might have seen great to have this wonderful rah-rah speech. We have, you know, fixed a lot of the things and planning and development and as, we, as it relates to business, building safety and engineering department. We've gotten all these wonderful new businesses that have come into the city as a result of some of the changing set of changes that have taken place, whether it is the hostel that Emily Dorr created, um, whether it was a big project like Whole Foods being brought into the city. I think that there still needed to be more discussion about what is being done to fix the city as it relates to the state review team coming in and the process that they're going through because I think at the end of the day for the average citizen it's one thing to find out what's going on with the lighting projects that are going on. It's great that we are going to have more um, residents moving back to the city as a result of Project 14 and its expanded focus but at the end of the day if we are under a EFM rain what does that mean to the average citizen? I think it's very necessary and important to be, you know, practical about the budget deficit and um, how to deal with it. I want to see creative solutions, you know, that end up in people being better off, not just a paper deficit solution, you know. I want to know how your how your budget solutions are going to make the city and the people in it better off. I think uh, to stand up just as a man and mention the violence in the city and the fact that he didn't really um, take it as something that was a light issue but something that was really um, unacceptable um, for the, the future of our city as far as violence and crime. Mm -hmm. I think that was important. Um, there was some very optimistic um, future plans, um, very ambitious plans that he, that he mentioned. Um, now it's about execution. Um, we got to get behind our city leadership. We might not all times agree with uh, how they do things or maybe even what they're concentrating on, 
but um, we really don't have a choice um, to be divided right now. Um, a divided city is not going to get us where we want to go. In the Detroit neighborhood of Rosedale Park, there is a community theater called Park Players Detroit, and they're getting ready to put on their latest production this month. Ashley Hennon had the opportunity to sit down with one of the people that makes Park Players Detroit tick. Here's her story. My background, I've been working in the metro Detroit area for 25 years in theater, professional community theater, directing work at the high school in Livonia. Well, I'm... I'm not trained in the theater. My training is in education and um, the ministry and psychology. So everything I've learned in theater, I've learned on the boards. And um, someone gave me a chance at a little theater in Livonia called Trinity House 25 years ago, and they showed me how to do it. And I think how I've grown is that I've, I've learned to rely on all the people around me to help me instead of feeling like I had to bring it all myself. Um, I've also grown in patience and kindness. I get back and act sometimes on the boards to remind myself of what it's like to be up there and need that director to just not be on your back all the time. Um, it's all teaching to me. What, wherever I go, whatever I'm doing, I'm always teaching. So I like to teach people how to do things. And so I don't just direct them and move them, but I try to teach them how to do the process themselves. And uh, my goal is what Viola Spolin said was to, to free the actors to be what they, the most that they can possibly be on the stage. That's my goal. I have been wanting to direct this play. I begged them at the high school to let me do it, and the principal wouldn't tackle it because of the title. I think it's witty. I think it is very, um, it's very satirical, which is my kind of humor, and it has a lot of commentary on other musicals, so it's especially attractive to people who love musical theater. We are not good stewards of our water or of our other resources, for sure, in this country. We're very wasteful, and there is a lot of graft in government going on with big business. Um, so there's always that theme of the rich versus the poor in our country that we're well aware of. And I think there are some good underlying thoughts about that that come out in the show. Um, the theater I'm most drawn to is theater that really speaks to issues. Uh, the favorite play I directed here was To Kill a Mockingbird, and it was wonderful because this community is so racially diverse, our theater community, and that's unusual in this area. And um, it stirs people, you know, when you deal with subjects like racism, when you deal with subjects like economics and things that people don't have hot buttons about. Well, I, I like things that um, force people to think outside their mindset. Um, I, my son was involved in a play at Western where they were supposed to be studying Dr. Kevorkian and writing a play, and they ended up writing this magnificent play about death from all different aspects. You, you don't have just one opinion when you sit down with an audience of 120 people. You have 120 opinions. And I like the people getting upset enough that they want to talk about it afterward, that they want to do something, or um, that it move them, move them deeply in their heart. This theater is genius when it comes to collaboration. All of the artists love to bring what they do best, and they work well together to solve problems. And people who are lighting designers add to set ideas, and the set people come, and they multitask in the front office. There's so much shifting around that people do. And they do it with great passion, and they do it with great love and respect for one another. And that's also a very rare trait in the theater. Well, that does it for another week of Detroit Unspun TV. We hope you've been informed and entertained during the last half hour. As always, there are a lot of people to thank for making this show happen. And this week, I'd like to thank my dog, Barney, for providing us some entertainment while we were shooting the show. And of course, we've got to thank you, the viewer. Thanks for taking the time out to view this program. Buena suerte, Detroit.